we're hearing that lots and lots of projects, but it still doesn't quite knit together for kind of national policy or, or, or markets. Where are we at? We're at a stage of enormous diversity and huge innovation. Huge innovation in, in relating to poor groups, in different forms of contract, in different forms of payment terms. We need, in every context, in every walk of life, champions and role models, pioneers, risk takers, we've said, um, to build an environment where poorer people can then, can then become confident in getting involved. And in this sense, you know, all the usual development lessons apply. We're now getting a little bit more sophisticated about the business case, but we have not gone we haven't gotten as far as a business case that attracts sales and attract revenue uh, as opposed to attracting grants. Um, and here the difficulty of course is, is you know, this focus on carbon where the price uh, is not uh, particularly stable. And frankly, um, okay, we can talk about building enterprise skills uh, uh, and, and helping people to make that business case, but until there's a really solid policy discussion, I don't know what context, green economy or something, um, we, uh, we may not have a stable context. The other thing that seemed to me to come across the whole thing is, is how localized this is. In a way, it's about how ecosystem services become formally part of, of people's, of the local landscape, of people's culture, of local economies. So we need to think of these the context where pest takes place as local economies and, and study them perhaps as, as, as green economies. The last thing I heard is we need to shift a bit more from this kind of supply push approach to pest to a more stand back demand side discussion. What do poor groups actually want in relation to ecosystem services? What do they want to produce? Uh, what can they do? Uh, as well as the demand side look at markets. I think um, there are still some big questions out there. Um, one, of the, one of the questions that uh, puzzles me is this, um, and it's been there for ages, this big tension between uh, people who view what needs to be done to uh, improve ecosystem management and safeguard livelihoods. Uh, it has to be driven from the top down at policy level, government level that we need to have, and, and it's the kind of you know, what we see within the red community, particularly looking through the lens of national level um, commitments, followed by national level policy, feeding down to, you know, strategies that, that, that get implemented and filter down. And we see these, and, and that has to be driven by massive, you know, big scale, stern level commitments of, you know, $100 billion a year into the sector and that's somehow going to solve it. And we've seen that, a big push of that the last five years, and we've, but we've, got to a stage where the red, while the red um, agenda has moved forward to some extent at the, in the climate negotiations on a written out, which is, I see it in some way, the way the CDM developed and included forestry with vast minutiae, but then nothing actually happened. There's a, we're reaching a stage in the red negotiations where the amount of money on the table, apart from Norway, massive donor, you know, other countries, and I've been speaking to donors in the UK, Germany, the US, they're kind of saying, yeah, well, we like this sort of thing at top level, but we don't actually have the money to solve all the problems at the scale where these top-down things, you know, people want. So, so, uh, and then you've got the bottom-up who, as you say, it's, these projects are lovely and they show some great things, but they're very fragmented and they don't get the scale. PES is on the margins. So it's on the margins of the conversation, it's on the margins of the ecosystems, the corridors. It seems like it's on the margins of the financing it's on the margins of the top level, and it's on the margins on the bottom level. So if you're using a donor term, it's not mainstreamed yet. But, and, there, and maybe you can even think of that in a watershed metaphor. It's not, you know, it's not the rivers, it's not the big systems yet. It's still literally on the margins, but it, it's a start. I think that in terms of PES, um, a big error, a big mistake, um, is to think that PES is the instrument to, is the objective or is the instrument to solve anything, any problem, and that we should aim at 
um, concentrate on PS. It's not, it's not. It's, it's, it's going to be probably in the margins, it's going to be one of a typology, it's going to be one thing. But what we need to do is really increase our understanding of these value chains, of these um, markets in which the farmers, even if they're subsistence farmers, they still work within a market either because they are in the market or because they can't reach that market, but they want to. So we need to understand how instruments like PES or like other types of rewards or instruments can help these people um, really capitalize and then get benefits that will actually provide the sustainability in the long term. So that's our next step. We could continue just designing the perfect scheme, but until we move from the supply push to actually what you said is where's the demand, where's the pool coming from, we won't move out of the margins. And what I would like to see is, as I agree with Ina, is, yeah, PES is a tool. I don't think it needs to be so much at the margins, but it will remain at the margins as long as we're pushing and not listening to the pull and not linking into things like the supply chain, into the, or into the value chain and markets, etc. So it's moving out of that periphery, we're making it relevant. I would like to, you know, I come from India and just, and I've also worked in China, so some of the opportunities that exist in these countries for the emerging economies in the South, as payments, South-South payments, and I know IIED does some work on Sino-African uh, uh, relationships and so on, so it might be worth looking into those areas as well, as potential sources of demand. Would Chinese companies as part of their CSR pay for PEST programs in Africa? I think one of the critical questions, something that I'm very excited about today is the issue of financial sustainability of PES schemes. Um, I was so pleased to hear it coming on again and again and again, and people seriously thinking about that, something needs to be done. And I've always been asking myself the same similar question on uh, how, what, what's, what's the ex exit strategy in the business plan? Because the problem is you cannot, you can, I don't think it's reasonable to think that we can pay farmers forever. And from the outset, we need to think about, because the idea of PS when it first emerged was to achieve some level of uh, desirable uh, he behavioral change of land users, for instance. And that the, the conceptual, at least theoretically speaking, that behavioral change had to be achieved some years down the line. Then at that point, you wouldn't need to pay uh, anymore. And I'm, I'm sure I was challenged with similar questions by Helen at some point. And, uh, I have constantly been thinking about it. So I think one of the fundamental questions that need to be asked is how do we empirically try to understand or contextualize that in terms of determining when do I stop paying? We only also need to look at the business case for payment for ecosystem services in relation to other uh, business activities. Um, I think that's important. But then there's another topic that... Um, I, we are trying to, to address, which is called, uh, well, let's say a regeneration or renovation, because we are in a situation where the environment has been degraded already in certain uh, situation, agricultural situation. So you want to invest again. So what kind of money do you have to invest? Where does that money come from? Can this scheme play a role so that you can come to another stage of your business that enables you to have a better business. So are you able to use this money for a certain purpose, not just continuously, or, but to, to improve? But that's different from where you're looking at a situation where you want to conserve something. When we talk about valuing ecosystem services, and not necessarily in the context of payments for ecosystem services, but that different ecosystem services are valued differently by different stakeholders. What's the value for money, particularly if you're getting donor support? If you can talk about using this for a short term as a transition to a, to a better way of land management or um, marine system management, whatever, which is actually self-supporting, that's going to be a heck of a lot easier to get support for 